What's up, everyone? I'm Matt Nagaki, the vocalist of Trip Chopsy, the host of the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast. And for me, my metal god is a very simple one, obviously. If anyone knows who I am, they know who I'm going to say. And of course, I'm talking about the best vocalist in the world, the most extreme vocalist, but he can also like croon you and it's like suede. It's beautiful his voice when he wants to be, but it's also super extreme. Mike Patton, of course, my metal god. Come on, who else would there be? Awesome. All right, Matt, there's a lot to dig into. Um, before we do that, in case that we need to, we need to make sure that we stay healthy, that we stay hydrated, lubricated. Uh, I think I saw a can floating by just before we hit the record button. What, uh, what are you drinking right now? I am drinking uh, something I've never had before from a newer, newish, three, four month old brewery from here in Quebec, the province of Quebec. This is actually from the city of Quebec. This is from Nano Cinco. They are an up and coming brewery here. If they are not on any, everyone's radar by now, they should be. They are typically making monstrous haze, which is sort of like guilty pleasure of mine. So this is a, an IPA. It's a they call it Mega Rush, Mega R S H. It's a pale ale, which is another big thing going on, right? So it's these hot, super hazy, hoppy, but low ABV beer. So you can drink a bunch of them. This one is. 5.8%, so they got Mega, Motueka hops, Nelson Sauve, and Southern Cross. I believe that they're all New Zealand hops. New Zealand hops are really taking off and destroying the scene in a good way. I like it very much, so I'm going to crush this. And uh, Nano Cinco people, trust me. The there you go. Shit. Awesome. And that's, uh, that's always a bold move going with a brewery that's only a few months old. Uh, so let's see if they got their stuff down. I'm going to join you with uh, a sea monster from local Toronto brewery, Radical Road. This is a Baltic Porter um, Ooh, coming in dark. at uh, 8%. So Ooh, going big and dark. Yeah, we'll see how this beautiful dark caramel color. So Matt, Mike Patton. Most people will assume that people get to know Mike, for the first time with Faith No More, is that for you the case as well? Or did you discover um, him before that already? I got into Mike Patton really late, actually. So so I, it's been over 20 years now because I'm an old man. But uh, I got into Mike Patton as a package, as a vocalist. I got into Mike Patton and it was, I was introduced to Mike Patton by my good friend Vincent Bradonucci, uh, who I went to high school with. Uh, he was always that, like friend that would pass you tapes, that would pass you CDs, that, you know, he showed me Slipknot, Corn, Limp Bizkit, I, Deftones, I discovered everything, Marilyn Manson, I discovered everything with Vincent Bradonucci, and he said, Matt, you gotta check out Mike Patton, you gotta check out Mr. Bungles. Mr. Bungle was first for me, and it was okay. like, at a time, it was in probably 2000, 2001 maybe, and obviously the band was defunct at that point, they're back now, but at that point they were defunct. And so was Faith No More at that point too. So it was interesting to have like this whole realm of stuff to discover from an artist because the internet was available and happening, right. and downloading happened. So I had like these mix CDs is what happened. And I downloaded like everything onto to multiple CDs. I had like a Mr. Bungle one. I had a Tomahawk because Tomahawk was happening at that time too. I had a Faith No More. I had everything, basically everything all at once. Um, the ones that I really got into early on was definitely Mr. Bungle for sure. Okay. That first, first Mr. Bungle and California. Um, Disco Volante was pretty wacky. And I remember purchasing that CD and like yeah. sitting there and not quite understanding what the fuck was happening <laughs> Still, um, but of course you know because back in the day you bought cds so so because i did actually purchase that one so so when you buy something right. back in the day you would give it more than one listen as opposed to the modern day and age way of consuming music nowadays it's so like you don't like it next and you never listen to it again but back in the day it was an investment so i i would still force myself to listen to disco volante and i listened to it probably a few weeks ago and i was like oh yeah okay i remember like sort of like understanding this part of it and all these sections of it understanding but it was fucking weird so so definitely mr bungle first um it was weird it was the funky clowny carnivalesque funny but 
scary at the same point right. too. I really enjoyed like the funk part of it because I was super into Incubus's science. So it was sort of like a transitionary aspect there. As I got older, Faith No More became more prominent in my life. Um, but yeah, I, yeah. I, it was really from like a mix series. So it was interesting that like I would like this song, but I would like that song. And it was all in a mixed up order. It wasn't in, in like a, an album. The first song you want to highlight, which one would that be? It has to start with, the, it's John Travolta, quote, unquote, I believe it's called. It's the first track from the first Mr. Bungle CD. It's so weird, and then like the glass shatters, and the, the ba -ba -bam, ba -ba -bam, ba -ba -bam. it's it's so good. I, like you, you can put it on anytime, anywhere, and I'm I'm gonna head bang. It's it's just it's just fucking awesome. And what a weird and his vocals are strange. It's yeah, like yeah. not serious, but super super prolific at the same time. What what a track and and the Travolta. I still don't know what the hell he's talking about. There's probably <laughs> stuff out there about it, and I don't necessarily right. care. I know what the song means to me, but it's weird. I feel like like there's like a long intro where there's no music that comes in until the glass breaks, and then the the big bass funky sort of heavy riff comes in. Just awesome. To some level, it's that, oh, you don't like it, you just don't get it, you know, kind of vibe. But at the same time, he's been massively successful, has headlined big festivals, mainstream rock festivals as well. So it doesn't happen a lot that an artist that is both kind of like hipstery or culty still goes into that mainstream or gets embraced. What do you think with artists like Mike make that difference? If he's going to listen to this, he's not going to like my answer. Uh, the reason why everyone likes Mike Patton is because of Faith No More. They were so big that that first record that he was on with them was, was monstrous. Mm -hmm. just monstrous it was all over the place um just a huge success so so from there it was just a massive launching pad right so so you know the, the mr bungle got picked up by warner brothers which is huge for a weird weird band and then the, what did they, they went and delivered disco volante after the most unappealing <laughs> uncommercial thing that they could ever give a major label and they still were successful with it at a lower scale, of course. But but Faith No More right. is is the reason why, and and that's not the reason for every artist. But I think it was just it's such a successful, successful first first album. And there's there's all the stories of Angel Dust and why mm -hmm. it was just the the nightmare sophomore follow up record, even though it's their third record, whatever. But um, Mike's follow up. There's a lot of pressure in the studio. There's a lot of fighting because being successful is difficult. Um, but I, I, I honestly think that's really the reason. They had such a platform, he had such a platform, and yeah. him being so eclectic in his musical preferences and what he likes to showcase, he just painted a narrative with, with his personality throughout everything, throughout everything that he did. The, the lovage, the, the weird music to make love to your old lady with, which is awesome in a strange, funny way but it's it's catchy as all hell peeping tom um phantom us it's like it never ends and dylan's right. escape plan you know dylan's escape plan loses a vocalist and they pick up mike Patton. it's like you can't invent this shit I'm the best you'll ever <laughs> just just but why does it work as it's he's i think there's the elitism he, he's painted like an elitist um like canvas for his projects for if he's involved in it or if it's on Ipecac Records, his record label, you already get that sort of sense that like, oh, this is going to be like an artsy thing. I might not right. get it, but it, it's good, right? Because it has the stamp of approval. It's, it's the way that I enjoy anything that comes from Pelagic Records as well, because I know that Robbins put his finger on it from the ocean. So um, I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's a mystery, but definitely that, that first right, it was massive, like really very, very popular. And I, I, despite what he's doing now with Mr. Bungle, he will never be as big as anything that he's does with Faith No More in any of his projects. Sadly. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, you've mentioned Faith No More now quite a few times and also as one of the key reasons that oh, yeah. maybe today we are talking about Mike Pan because without the success of that initial thing, maybe you would have never discovered him to begin with. Is one of the songs that you want to highlight a Faith No More song? Oh yeah, amazing. Um, me discovering extreme vocals, Mike Patton, complete influence on that for sure. Just pushing the voice, the human voice, to more and more extreme levels. Um, Cuckoo for Cat Cat. What a fucked up, weird approach to vocals, and it works, and he can do it flawlessly, I'm sure. But what what a weird weird extreme freak out in that section there yeah and i still don't know what that song is but that's another one take it from my drummer blob getting good being good it gets you stuff or something is the, the, the how the song ends and it sounds like he's talking about like endorsement deals which it seems to be like first <laughs> level for it to be about that but um yeah cuckoo for cack it Your eyes light up every time you use the word weird uh, when you talk about yeah. him. Um, Love the weird. The, the, um, the freedom he gave himself to be weird and to kind of do his thing with, with at times at the, at the expense of other things. Um, I think it must have been uh, on purpose to get it so far away right. from the real thing. Is, is he that... was so annoyed of being popular and, and giving the man, let's say, another right, hit. Right that why not make something just so fucking out there that, that they can't commercialize it. The fact that he was out there and that he just kind of did his thing, but also the fact how he pushed the limits of his own voice and what a human voice can do. And, and just because there's people that can growl and scream like crazy beyond what Mike ever did. But Mike would basically go on a roller coaster with his own voice within a song at times. Um, yeah. What is uh, is any of these two has been the biggest influence on you, or is there another lesson you you took from being a fan of of Patton? I think it was really just the the, the ability to just flick flick it on and off was a big thing because when I got into Patton, I was singing in a metalcore band, so there was definitely that harsh, clean vocal, kill switch engage type thing. Yeah. yeah. And if you listen to like <laughs> my first demos of Three Mile Scream, I, I'm basically a Mike Patton ripoff, like very, very, very much so. So so definitely those two things he definitely influenced me on trying trying to be able to have that vocal control to flip the switch to go from harsh to clean as flawlessly right. and then pull it off live not just in the studio but something that you can do live and still put on a show not just because he's he's an amazing vocal performer but he's also an amazing performer right very intense to you know, especially late 90s the, the those performances with mr bungle and when he was with dillinger just just so fucking extreme on stage as well as his performance which is something else that i strive I, i'm still striving to do that so yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah. Trying, I'm trying to keep the energy up while the performance is still top notch have you taken that that influence or your own emulation in in, in, a, in a respectful way to the extreme as in have you ever any of your bands ever covered any of this material i don't believe i have maybe a faith no more song but it wasn't anything serious, never, never on a stage or anything. It might have just right. been at a jam type sort of situation. But no, no, I have not. No. But okay. uh, maybe one day we'll see. Maybe, maybe one day. And maybe maybe that one song that gets covered is the third and final pick that you wanted to highlight. Which one? Oh, there's is definitely it? a huge, a huge. And I mean, California for Mr. Bungle. Uh, Retro Vertigo. Mm -hmm. is a track that I hold near and dear to my heart. When I was first touring with Cryptopsy, I would warm up and then I would sing Retro Vertigo as like my final warm up to see how I was feeling that night. 
So so 100% Retro Vertigo. It's like a movie soundtrack. It's it's so fucking amazing and beautiful and mm-hmm. haunting. Uh, just so good. Uh, his vocals are incredible on that track. And and I'm, I'm talking a lot about Mr. Bungle, but it's 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 really important for me. And I and I I'm I'm going to be that I don't like the new thrash Mr. Bungle. I like California. California is where it ends for me. Even though like the new album is the first album and I'm just being yeah. my own elitist pig in my own head here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure that Mike would appreciate that that, that <laughs> openness. Um, talking about openness, um, in the last, let's say, 10 years, um, there, there's also been a different side more in the forefront of Mike Patton. And he has maybe pissed off thousands of people by making, you know, split this, well, come, can come across split decisions about not continuing or not starting tours and shows because you're having to take care of yourself. But I also feel like he's done... Mike Patton, especially in the world of hard rock and metal, where as much as we're all trying to be, um, and I'm going to use it as a very positive word, woke in metal, um, there's a lot of stereotypes still, a lot of uh, stigmas in metal. And one of the things that it's still hard to do, as a, especially as a frontman of a big band, is to be open and honest and vulnerable. and putting your own mental health first. Uh, he probably blew the lid of that, or is one of the people that that allowed for more conversations about that. And sure, it's never fun when an artist is not playing a show that you were looking forward to for a whole year or something like that. I, I can appreciate that. But um, allowing yourself to put yourself first and being more vulnerable and being more open with your audience, is that something that for you in the last few years, just even more put him on a pedestal for you. Um, what's your take on that? I, I think mental health is is priority number one. Uh, there's a lot of times that artists will do that, but they'll, they'll, for the good of the band, sacrifice themselves. Right. And that's not okay. I'd, I'd much rather miss a hundred shows and still have him be alive and creating music and having something for me to cherish for the rest of my life rather than him pushing himself and going out and doing one tour and then right. that's a blip and then that's it that's the rest of it no you have to think of yourself you have to take care of yourself and you have to listen to what's going on within yourself so for the band for the fans for everything i'm sure it was shitty but i'm sure that they appreciate that their brother right. their bandmate their their idol is still going to be there creating new music for the next 20 years because they made this decision. So, and, and you are right that a lot more artists are starting to speak about the burnouts of touring and mm-hmm. the, the impact of, of what day-to-day tour life is like, because it's amazing, right? We, we hashtag tour life, you see it out there all the time. It's it's a void being on tour. You're you're surrounded by people, but you're completely isolated. It's It's, it's not easy. You know, when one person's in a black void, sometimes it drags other people within it. So tour life is super fun, obviously, but it's it's dangerous. And it's, if you're not going to take be in a good mindset when you step out the door to even start a tour, maybe maybe not even going on the tour is the right decision. Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, I mean, maybe a bit of a forced segue, and I don't want to, you know, abandon such an important topic straight away, but. Um, talking about going on tour, playing shows, and continuing to create music. Um, I'm just going to use that as a forced segue to, to, to put you on the spot. Um, what's going I mean, we've seen you being very active. Obviously, congratulations on 400 episodes with Vox and Hops, which is amazing. Um, also, congratulations on all the brutal stuff you've been doing. Um, what else is going on in Matt world? Uh, cheers. Uh, and what's going on in cryptos- cryptopsy world. Well, I'll fin- we'll finish, we'll wrap up with Vox and Hops. I have a few projects with Vox and Hops going on right now, and then we'll transition into cryptopsy afterwards. Uh, so yes, I just wrapped up another brutal event here in Montreal. I did one in Winnipeg earlier this year. That's my metal and beer fest where um, we hang out and I drink beer and enjoy metal shows with cool beers. Um, I'm doing a massive global beer collab project called pit culture where i've teamed up with uh, metal injection is presenting the project and yakima chief hops are fueling the project by providing amazing hops to all the breweries involved so far there are 26 a 27th has just joined the project 
uh, across the globe. There's breweries from everywhere, basically, Canada, the States, Mexico, um, Denmark, France, uh, Japan, Australia, Cyprus, the, the list goes on. Um, and the whole point of this project is to showcase what truly happens in a mosh pit. I've toured all over the globe. I've played shows in lots and lots of fucking countries. And every mosh pit is just about the same, which is very interesting. So I wanted to showcase what truly happens in a mosh pit. People from outside of the metal spectrum doesn't seem to understand that it's actually a place full of love and respect. It's like a mutual agreement that you get into when you mm -hmm. walk into a mosh pit. You know that you are in a dangerous place, but at the same time, it's a place of respect and love. So every beer has a specific name, such as Circle Pit, Wall of Death, um, and on the side of the can, it describes exactly what that movement means. So I think that's super cool. The beers will be coming out throughout the course of the year. Uh, an amazing picture from Susan Moss, who's a photographer here in Montreal, is showcased on the can. And uh, yeah, I'm stoked about that. Pitch Culture, big project that I've been working on for the past five, six months. <laughs> And then in the world of Cryptopsy, we are releasing a new album. We finished it. It's done. We handed it in. Um, depending when this comes out, we will have announced that we are on a record label, which uh, it's been a long time coming. We signed in 2020. I'm very stoked to finally get it out there. The album is coming out at a predetermined date. Um, I'm stoked about it. The material is strong. Uh, we are shooting music videos this coming weekend. I, I can't wait. It's, it's Cryptopsy is back. It's been a long time since... Uh, you know, I wear a lot of hats. I'm a dad, early childhood educator. I've been doing the podcast really intensely for the past four going on five years. And it's going to be nice to switch gears back into Matt from Cryptopsy and get on stage and tour and showcase this new record. Matt, thank you so much for sharing all that information. I look forward to seeing you guys on a stage very soon uh, and getting more announcements. And obviously, I hope to see you on a stage holding um, a pit culture beer in my hand. Um, oh, so yes. uh, very excited about that. Thank you so much for sharing, uh, opening the door or op uh, lifting the curtain a little bit and, uh, and sharing some of your love for Mike Patton. And uh, thanks again for being here. He's the best. I didn't even talk about Phant Phantomas. Come on. There's, there's, I can keep going. I can keep going. <laughs> the only time I ever saw him live was with Peeping Tom. You know that? Every oh, time no. he comes to Montreal, really? I'm on tour. Every time he comes to Montreal, I'm on tour. Every time. Yeah, but it's, uh, I will say I'm that seeing He's on Mike Patton crooning, um, you know, easy like Sunday morning at Grass Pop, just like, and everybody in the field is just quiet, of chilling, listening. Perfect. I'm, circ awesome. I'm circling him too. He's like the ultimate white whale guest for the podcast. I've, 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 I've interviewed people from Bungle, from Faith No More, from Tomahawk, from 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 Dead Cross. I've, I've, I've circ spoken to so many of his bandmates. I'll get him one day. watching this video click right here to see more content like it and subscribe to the channel